So the internet has dramatically changed our life. If we have a question, we simply Google it. We read most of our news online, and we socialize with Facebook and Twitter. We take it for granted, but in the 1960s, even the simple collaboration of peers around the world in a shared document in real time was probably unimaginable. More than the missing technology, I believe that the conceptual leap was just too big to take place. I believe we are in, at, at the brink of a much greater transition. Not only it will impact every ter territory of our life, every industry, but rather it will lead to new, to formation of new social, new organizational structures in our society. I believe that decentralized networks, and I'll keep getting back to that term terminology, will take over the roles of banks and corporations and insurance companies within a decade or two. And I believe that will be just the beginning. So if you look at those murmuration of those starlings, to me they look a lot more like a living creature rather than a flock. Look at their movement at the flow and beyond the beauty of that movement, what fascinates me is that it seems that there is no single bird that is responsible for that movement to coordinate. Imagine with these decentralized networks of millions of people rather than birds and computers cooperating around shared goals. How would it look like? What it would take? And would it be good or bad? The basis for this revolution is the blockchain technology, the technology underlying Bitcoin. It was introduced in 2008 by Satoshi Nakamoto, the anonymous inventor of Bitcoin. Blockchain is this decentralized platform for storing and managing value records. And it sounds a little bit complicated, so let me explain. Middlemen are everywhere in our economy. They are there to store our records, they are there for agreements about those records and to take decisions. I own something if there is a social agreement that I own that thing. It's simply as that. Ownership is set by social agreement. And if there is no such agreement, then I don't own it. Now, this agreement needs to sit somewhere. For example, if banks say that I own $20 and you own 30 then we just trust the bank's records to hold for the truth. But as long as that this record needs to be somewhere, it also needs to be at the hands of someone, which gives them enormous power. Blockchain is this decentralized platform for tracking records of value. So it keeps tracking who owns what at any point of time. By being decentralized, it means that it sits nowhere and everywhere. Or rather, each computer in the network will store a copy of that ledger, that public ledger, and can confirm the validity of that co copy. So the entire network simultaneously keep in consensus. Everyone can access the, ownership, the, the records, can, can control the records of his own assets, so I can transact money to my friend in China with the click of a button. And the money just goes through instantaneously. The whole magic of blockchain is the ability to maintain that consensus continuously. And this is a long-standing, is a resolution to a long-standing problem in computer science called the double spending problem. So let me give you an example. If I hold one Bitcoin, and then let's say that I publish to that side of the network that I send this Bitcoin to a friend A. And at the same time, I publish to that side of the network that I send the Bitcoin to a friend B. Now, this part of the network will hear first the message that I send it to friend A, they will process that, and when they will hear about the other message, they will render it illegal. Whereas this part of the network will see reality oppositely. So we just diffracted the network. The whole magic of blockchain is that somehow that network is being able organically to recover and in mere seconds agree about a consensus about a single reality. But we rely on intermediaries more than just to store our records we also rely on them on to process our agreements. Let me give you an example. 
So let's say that you and I, we want to place a bet. For the entire history of humankind, we had to have a third party that we could give the place, the agreement, and the funds to secure and process the contract. So wherever we have economic interaction, we need intermediaries, we need middlemen to execute our con contracts, to execute our economy. Now, with the, with the advent of blockchain 2.0, we can also remove intermediaries from that. Wherever before, we placed, we wrote the agreement in paper or in code, and we placed it at the hand of a third party, both of us trust, together with the funds, now we can simply write it in code. We can place that code onto the blockchain. It has an address. We call it smart contract. And then we can transact money to that contract. From that point and onwards, the blockchain guarantees to self-execute the contract by the code, unambiguously. No middleman, no friction whatsoever. So if, if the magic of the blockchain 1.0 was that somehow the entire network is being to agree to be in consensus about records, in blockchain 2.0, the entire network is in consensus about the records, about agreement over the records, and about the execution of those agreements. If you want, if blockchain 1.0 is some sort of public ledger, then blockchain 2.0 is a public computer, decentralized computer. This technology is already in process of replacing and reforming basically the entire financial infrastructures of today. The largest corporations, governments, banks, insurance companies are all in a race to develop and implement the technology. But in our economy, we also rely on intermediaries in a deeper sense. We rely on middlemen to take decisions for us, to direct and coordinate. We need a CEO to run a company. We need governments to collect and distribute taxes. And we need a mayor to run a city. We also need Airbnb to coordinate between people and the value flow between those people in a home rental network. There is already a movement toward decentralization of opinion, decentralization of coordination. For example, today, if I'm hungry, probably I will not ask the professionals for what is the best solution in the neighborhood, and rather I will just check up Yelp for the crowd's opinion. But as long as the power is at the hand of the platform owners, as long as the power is concentrated, there is unavoidable conflict of interest and single point of failure. So what if then we had something like the Facebook network? but operated from the computers of peers on the network solely, peer-to-peer, -peer, without any central server, and no company, and no management, self-organization. What if we had a social version of Uber, a ride-sharing app, living on the mobile phones of everyone, speaking with each other, peer-to-peer, -peer, with no central management, no central server, no central control? What if thousands of software developers could spontaneously cooperate and develop software together. Shares of the network will be distributed to participants according to their contribution, the value of their contribution, as perceived by other peers in that network. But you may ask, how those crowds get decision together? Clearly, each participant has her or his own opinion, but how do they form consensus towards a single action? How do we design such a system to be resistant to fraudulent behavior? How do we incentivize participation of, of people in, the, in their best professional way? And how do we maximally align the interests of everyone? These are exactly the typical questions that I have researched with my colleagues over the past two years, the outcome of which we call decentralized governance protocol which forms the game theoretic basis for decentralized autonomous organizations. It is still a work in progress, but we are very near to the end and anticipating to launch the first decentralized organization in the coming year. Looking back at those starlings, you can again try to imagine decentralized networks of millions of people 
and computers cooperating around shared goals. Those networks would have their own personality, their own value system, and even their own identity. To the external observer, they would look a lot more like an organism, like a living organism, rather than organization. And at the end, it must bring us the question, would it be a good thing or a bad thing? Would it drive us to a better or worse future? And my answer to that is that technology, as always, is neutral. And thus, it only depends on us and on the way we use it. Thank you.